guys, welcome back to yet another GCSE revision video. Now, within this lesson, what myself and Mr. Sally's want to do is to show you the top quote you can use in any Christmas Carol GCSE exam. And this quote, we, we've selected it because number one, we believe you can use it for any of the characters that come up, but also most importantly, you can use it when it comes to theme discussion and of course, even context, okay? So, when it comes to the number one quote, which if you literally forget everything else, make sure you've committed it to memory, is the following quotation. This boy is ignorance. This goal is want. Ellipsis. Beware this boy, ellipsis, for on his brow is written doom. Now, the reason why I've selected this quotation is number one, this uh, extract and this part of the novel came up in the 2020 exam, meaning it's very unlikely it's going to come up again. So therefore, when you're going into your exam with this quotation, you already have your first elsewhere in the novella quotation. However, more importantly, I want to show you and we want to talk you through why it's such a powerful quotation that you can use in any question. So Mr. Savvies, what specifically really stands out about this quotation and why is it such a great and versatile quote to use in any Christmas Carol question? Brilliant, so I'll start off with the language analysis and I'm gonna underline ignorance and want. They are both capitalized as names and when you think about this novel, it's easy to say, oh, it's about the Christmas spirit, or it's about the attitudes to the poor, or it's about um, fear and redemption. And then you think, well, hang on, ignorance and want aren't really any of those things, especially not ignorance. And this is, why, this is Dickens' way of saying, look, my novel isn't just about what you think it's about, it's actually about these two really important ideas, and the most of the important ideas is, most of all, beware this boy. The most important is ignorance. And this is about education. And what he's saying is, if we don't educate the poor, they won't be able to improve their station in life because they, they won't be able to get suitable employment. They will always, therefore, be poor. They'll be resentful. And society will become the victim of revolution. Now he doesn't spell that out, but that is actually what happens three years later across Europe in 1948. There were revolutions everywhere mm. because the poor were not educated. And the difference was we didn't have revolutions in Britain because people like Dickens campaigned for schools for the poor and he helped set some up and he wanted his readers to realize how important education was. He couldn't fit that into a novel about Christmas. Uh, so he just has this tiny scene that is just plonked, literally in stage three in the middle. So I see it as the kind of pivot, the dead centre of the novel. And this is his way of saying, this is what I'm really talking about. Yeah, and I think also just taking it one step further with the ignorance um, analysis, remember that the boy is ignorant because he doesn't go to school. He doesn't get an education and hence he can't get a job. He then becomes the menace in society that Dickens' rich readers are frightened of, okay? So they're the ones who can't get a job in the future, hence they become the people that steal from them, that kill and try to take the property by force. So also you just want to talk about it also in terms of the fact that Dickens is also trying to show Scrooge and his rich readers that they also have a very personal and very selfish interest in making society a bit more equal and ensuring that, you know, for example, as Mr. Sally's mentioned, there were lots of ragged schools that were set up, ensuring that they can maybe improve the quality of the education because actually from a selfish perspective that they're for me it meant that we're going to be fewer people to worry about in terms of uh, theft and them just being a general menace in society. Now the other aspect of this um, quotation and why it's so interesting is when you are thinking about Dickens's overarching message within the novella. Dickens's message is firstly criticizing the vast inequalities that existed in Victorian England. And he uses the characters of ignorance and want to illustrate that these inequalities were only made worse. They were what we would say exacerbated by the selfishness and the greed of wealthy industrialists like Scrooge. Remember that 
when it comes to this quotation and even when Scrooge is being shown, you know, ignorance, Mont is really shocked and really horrified, but also when he sees the Quackshot family having dinner, he had no idea that this is how they lived, right? All he was just focusing on was keeping money to himself. And so Dickens' Victorian readers by extension, all of whom would be rich, they were the ones who had the money to afford the book, but also the leisure to read this book, they would also be equally shocked that society is producing these types of children, but it's actually indirectly because of them for underpaying the workers. Brilliant. So I'll pick up on that theme, and it comes back to the female figure, Want. And this is really interesting because when Scrooge uh, meets the ghost of Christmas yet to come, and he shows him how his body has been exploited once he's dead. Scrooge doesn't know that it's his body, but he sees the dead man's stuff has been stolen by the charwoman and the laundress and the undertaker's man, and they go and see old Joe, and they start trying to sell it to him. Now, Scrooge is horrified at the fact that this dead body, which he doesn't know is him, has been shown no respect, and he's been ripped off. But Dickens' point is, no, these people all have jobs, but they still have to turn to crime to make ends meet. Well, why is that? It's because of these readers who are employing the charwoman and the undertaker's man and the laundress, and they're just paying too little. So Dickens' point is, look, you guys, you're all paying people for work, but you're not paying them enough money so that they can live properly, and that's going to cost you in the long run like it costs Scrooge. Okay, so I'm curious. In terms of, so we've talked about obviously the underlying message and how this ties in to Dickens' general message, right, which cuts across any question that you get in Christmas Carol. Now, it's kind of obvious how this relates to Scrooge, because Scrooge's greed leads to and produces ignorance and want. How about the other characters? For instance, say you get a question related to one of the Cratchit families, one of the poor characters. How could you tie this into them? So, yeah, if I got the Cratchits, it would be a lovely one. Uh, so the, the Cratchits are not ignorant. They're all educated, but they still can't get enough money to survive. How do we know that? Well, Dickens tells us, because Scrooge says, oh, gosh, is Tiny Tim going to live? And the ghost says, he's not going to be here next year. And so he's making a really didactic point, a teachable point to Scrooge, saying, look, if you, if you don't pay the workers enough, then members of their family are going to die. And a crucial bit here, which ties to the ending of the novel, is that Bob Cratchit is paid 15 shillings. Dickens tells us twice in the novel that that's true, because it's important. Why? Because 15 shillings was the going rate. So Scrooge isn't being a miser when he pays Bob his wages. He's just paying what all the employers pay. And that's Dickens' real message. Society acts like Scrooge, because they create want and poverty by paying workers too little. Okay, and I think also, of course, when it comes to some of the other characters, right? So, for instance, the three ghosts. Yes. I think when you're thinking about ignorance and want, what this is showing is just how urgent society, or even urgently, society needs to change. So, say you get a question with the ghost of Christmas past, Christmas present, or Christmas yet to come. Obviously, Christmas present, this is where this appears, so it's a very obvious link you can make to the ghost of Christmas present. But when you're thinking about past and future, you still make a similar point, right? You still want to say that these two children are used to illustrate the urgency of change that is required. The Ghost of the Christmas Future comes to punish him, to condemn Scrooge because of what he has indirectly caused in terms of the suffering of the poor through ignorance and want. And of course, the Ghost of Christmas Past is trying to show Scrooge an alternative reality where ignorance and want is not created because someone like Fezziwig, who also is a rich businessman, is generously giving to his poorer workers. Right, quick fire then. <laughs> uh, how can I relate it to a question on fear? A uh, question on fear. So I think definitely in terms of a uh, question on fear, ignorance is one that uh, is used to really strike fear into the heart of Scrooge. He's a menace, as uh, I've mentioned before. He's used to illustrate how society is going to be very unstable and maybe there could be potential for future revolutions because of ignorance. So this creates fear within Scrooge, but also within his readers by extension. Oh, I've got to come up with something more difficult then. <laughs> uh, Fred. Question on Fred. Fred. Ooh, ooh, that's a tough one. So how is this boy is ignorance and this girl is want to be where this boy? I suppose I would probably make a very similar idea with Fred 
to Fezziwig. Go on. Fred isn't an employer, but he is upper class, arguably, right? And he also tends to have a more jovial attitude towards Christmas. He's happy. He also kind of sees Christmas as a time of giving and as a time of family. So people like Fred would actually be some of the change makers that uh, Dickens wants all of his readers to be when it comes to treating society more kindly, okay? So that wouldn't be a bit of a tough one. I think I'd probably talk about it from that angle. How about you? Brilliant. Uh, well, that was a hard one because you wouldn't <laughs> actually get a question on Fred, would you? Um, so I, yes, I would, I would link it to Fred being the role model for what Scrooge should be. Yeah. I always like to think in terms of contrast and antithesis. And so Fred is the antithesis, the opposite of Scrooge. And therefore, whereas Scrooge is creating ignorance and want, Fred is going to remove it. So mm -hmm. it ties in with your point. Okay, so that's really it when it comes to the number one quote you want to commit to memory and going into your Christmas carol exam, you want to use it. As I mentioned, it actually, the extract showing ignorance and want did come up in the past. And it's very unlikely that AQ8 is going to reuse exactly the same extract. Meaning, because you know it's not going to be reused again, that's going to be one of your elsewhere in the novel quotes, okay? You already have one quotation going in that you know, yep, when I'm thinking about what quote I've memorized, I'm going to use that for sure, okay? So that's really it guys and make sure you head over to Mr. Sally's channel where we go over the number one quote you need to know and you can use for any character or theme question in Macbeth. See you on my channel.